code so that we can actually create libraries for ourselves. Uh, utility libraries, uh, 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 rounding libraries if we want, etc. Uh, but before we get to, to that part, we need to discuss how to write functions and why we want to write functions to begin with. Uh, uh, in, in terms of code, a function is simply a reusable unit of code that may take inputs, uh, in, in other words, more than one, and produce, and it may produce an output. Uh, you're already familiar with the, some of the basic functions. The, the main function is what gets a program going. Uh, printf allows you to print stuff to the standard output. Square root is one of those examples from the standard uh, library function. And they all have the same syntax. You use these curly brackets. And that's because it's similar to math functions. Uh, if you write a math function, f of x is equal to sine x, right? You, you, uh, f is the function name. It's just math, so we, they just have f, g, h, right? Single letter functions. That's not good in code. Uh, you can also have functions that take two parameters, right? f, and f, f of x. You're look, uh, if you were to look at the first one, say f of x is equal to x squared, what does it look like? You're graphing it in two dimensions, right? Here's the x dimension, that's your input, and then you're graphing it up to the y dimension, that's your output. Uh, x squared would look something like this. It's a parabola concave up, right? f of x, y, that's two inputs. So what are you, what are you mapping? You're mapping something in three space, right? You're taking an x coordinate and a y coordinate, say in this plane right here, and then you're mapping it to a single output, z, right? And so you're mapping something into a, the third dimension. Uh, if you take, you can have three inputs, four inputs, five inputs. That's com perfectly fine in mathematics. It's just that you can't graph it anymore because now you're in the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, the sixth dimension, which we really can't conceive of living in the third dimension. Uh, but you can also have zero dimensions, right? What's an example of a function that doesn't matter what the input is? f of x is equal to, say, 1, right? What, is that, what does that graph look like now? It's just a straight line that intersects y at 1. There's no, it, it, uh, there, the input doesn't matter, so there is no input. However, in mathematics, can you have a function that has two output values, that, re uh, that uh, has two values, right? Let's, let's, take a, let's try to conceive of that without me having to write it up on the board. Here's a point on the x axis. Can you have this x point mapped to a point up here and a point down here? Because the y is your output, right? Is that, is that a function? No, it fails. What, what is that? What do we, we, we apply a test to this in mathematics to say that this is not a function. It's a vertical line test. If it fails the vertical line test, it's not a function. Likewise, in code, you do not have functions that return more than one value. You can have a function that returns no value or one value, but nothing else. You can have as many inputs as you want, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., but you can ha only have one output. All right? that, that's because it's very much like math functions. You cannot have two output values. All right? uh, why do we do functions? Functions facilitate facilitate, facilitate uh, code reuse, right? They're a reusable piece of code, uh, so you don't have to cut and paste, paste the same block of code over and over, right? Instead, if you've got a piece of common functionality that's useful, these three lines of code do something very useful. Uh, so useful that you use it up here, over there, and then the separate file over there. If it's in three different places, in fact, if it's in two different places, that's screaming out to you. Why don't you put that in a function so that it's reusable? You can write your own square root function, for example. It'd just be a simple linear, uh, like uh, some interpolation method or something. It'd be maybe five or six lines of code uh, to do some Taylor polynomial or something like that. Why would you cut and paste those six lines of code over and over again when you just need to uh, compute a square root? You put that stuff into a function, and now you use that function instead of uh, cut and pasting that code all over the place. Uh, it also provides what's called procedural abstraction. Right. Function, uh, so functions allow us to ignore uh, implementa implementation details right, of how a certain block of code or algorithm works. All right, so now think back to your last lab here, uh, last week when you were doing loops. 
uh, you uh, did a quick exercise to compute sine. Right? You could have used the math library function. Instead, uh, we had you do this as an exercise so that you'd get some practice doing loops. Do you remember what you used? What was that thing called? It was a Taylor, it was a Taylor polynomial, right? Um, before I gave that to you, so think back before I gave that, uh, we, we gave that exercise to you. In fact, the, the sign can be uh, uh, computed in many different ways, not just Taylor polynomials. There are interpolation methods, et cetera, et cetera. Did you ever actually think about it? Like, how does that square root method work? How does the sign method work? How, how, does, how do those functions work? Did you ever stop to think about it? No. Why? You didn't care. You wanted to use those. Uh, you wanted to use those functions. That's what procedural abstraction is. It allows you to not have to care or think about those details. Right? Uh, and uh, instead, uh, instead, uh, instead, excuse me. Functions. The, here's the key word: encapsulate functionality. That's why we call them functions, right? Uh, into reusable abstract blocks of code. Right? You don't have to worry about, oh, is that sign? Is, that, is it doing a Taylor polynomial? Is it doing uh, a, an identity? Is it doing a numerical interpolation method? Is it linear? What's its convergent properties? Who cares? Right? Just use it. Uh, just like what, likewise, you shouldn't have to care about the big picture code. Instead, solve little pieces of the, uh, uh, of the uh, of, of, you've got an overall problem. Break it down into smaller and smaller pieces until, OK, this looks like a good piece that I could put into a function and then reuse in several different places. Right? That's uh, procedural abstraction. That's the benefit of it. Encapsulating means that you're taking that functionality and wrapping it up into a capsule, throwing it into a function so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Right? This thing is now a black box. We put stuff in, we put input in, and it kicks out output. We don't care how it works anymore because we're done writing that function. Right? Functions allow us to do that. Without functions, we would have to worry about every single line of code over and over and over again. Right? Standard libraries. Third. Uh, and uh, other, uh, other uh, external libraries provide useful functions that have a lot of testing, debugging, optimization, et cetera, uh, behind them. Standard. There we go. So use them. Right? Again, one of the reasons that we like to write functions is that we can package them up into libraries. We can write test cases. We can optimize them. Uh, we can put thousands of man hours into testing this stuff, into, uh, into optimizing it, making it as fast and efficient as possible. And by putting it into a function and putting it into a library, everybody benefits from that. Uh, you, don't need to you don't need to worry about optimizing this little piece of code over here if you can just bring in a library. Without functions, that's not even possible. Right? You'd have to cut and paste the entire code base. Uh, so, and it also goes to uh, overall problem solving um, uh, strategies. Jeez, right? What's the first question? Uh, uh, I think we, uh, I might have mentioned it before, but what's the very first question you should ask yourself when you're solving a problem? Is it already solved? Did somebody already do this work for me, right? Uh, likewise, if you're writing a piece of code, the, the question you should ask yourself is, does a function already exist in the standard library or some external library that I can bring in and use? Like we solved on Thursday, or I guess it was Wednesday last week, right? We needed to round a sense. Well, there was no standard library to round a sense for us, right? But we could pull off, uh, an off-the-shelf solution round, multiply our number by 100, reuse that functionality, and then divide by 100 to get exactly what we wanted. So again, the overall problem solving strategy that you should ask yourself is, does a function already exist that solves our problem or that can be adapted to solve our problem? All right. There we go. So hopefully that motivates you enough that, yeah, we need functions. Functions are a good thing to have. We should probably start writing them. Uh, and every program that you've done up to this point has been probably one function the main function, and you threw everything in there. Uh, that's because you've done, been doing short programs. 
Uh, once you get into programs that are more than 20 lines of code, 30 lines of code, especially when you get into uh, to projects that are thousands upon thousands or millions of lines of code, putting that all into one function, that is definitely not uh, the way to go. It's completely disorganized. There's no way to work on it in any coherent manner. So you want to split your code up into smaller and smaller bits. Naturally, the unit of code that you're going to be sp splitting those up into are functions. And then you start collecting related functions into modules or libraries. Right? That's where we get those header files that we'll be talking about here shortly. So how do you do functions in C? Right? As with variables, right, you have to declare variables before you use them. So functions also have to be declared before you can use them. The way that we do that is in C, you declare a function by creating what's called a prototype. So in engineering, or in a lot of endeavors, what is a prototype? It's the first iteration, right? It's the first try at something. So uh, a, a prototype is basically a function declaration that this is what the function is or should be. We're not actually saying what the function does yet. That's going to be later with the definition. A prototype uh, it means that or it means that you define the three uh, components that make up a function's what's called a signature. Right? A signature, just like in real life, when you sign something, you're identifying it. Well, a signature is a function's definition. Right? How you need to identify that there is this function. It, here's its name. Here's its inputs. And here's its outputs. In fact, those are the three components. Uh, you identify the name right? or its identifier. Identifier. Just like with a variable, it's a name. the name of the variable is its identifier. Uh, and by the way, we're not going to go the math route of f of x, g of x, h of x. We want to call our functions what they do. We want to give them names. And because they do something, generally you're going to call them, you're going to give them verb names. Just like uh, variables are nouns, they're things. So you want to give them noun names. Functions uh, do things, so you want to give them verb names. Right? Uh, it's, or it's identifier, that is the, uh, the name uh, of the function. The second thing that you provide is a list of its inputs or parameters right? or arguments. You'll see all, the, all three of those uh, 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 designations interchangeable. Uh, I'll generally call them parameters, though. Um, the type of variable that it returns, that is, i.e., its output. Right? Those are the three things that go into a prototype, into a function signature. You have to say what it takes as input, the name of the function, and then it's out, the type of output that it returns. So just to get into it here, let's go ahead and take a look at a very simple example. Uh, let's see. What did I Yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, here's a distance function. So uh, let me go ahead and define what this function does. This function computes the Euclidean distance between two variables given by x1, y1, and you, uh, you need two points, right? So x1, y1, and then x2, y2. Let me go ahead and correct, correct that spelling. There we go. Uh, and uh, x2, y2. There we go. Oops, I need to go in code mode, sorry. There we go. There, now it's nicely formatted. All right. So that's just documentation right there. I'm using doc style comments, uh, which are the slash, star, star, and then a vertical line of stars ending with a star slash. And I'm basically documenting what the purpose of this function is. Uh, this is what we mean when we say that there should be documentation. Up till now, all of your programs, we've just expe been expecting that header up there, author, date, and a brief explanation. From here, this point on, any function that you write, though, you need to document every single function. This is what that function does. Give a plain English explanation of what this is. 
Uh, you, can, you can provide additional documentation. For example, what, what the hell is Euclidean distance? Well, here's a Wikipedia article on it. And put in uh, a nice, uh, HTML, uh, a nice uh, uh, URL for somebody to go look that up if, they, if they're interested in what that is. Uh, for us, though, what is it? What's the, how, how do you compute the distance between two points? x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. And then what do you do with it? Then you take the square root of the entire thing. Very, very different from the, uh, the law of spherical co cosines that you use to compute air distance. Because the air distance, that was on a sphere, a globe. Imperfect sphere, but you were, uh, you were just estimating it, right? This is different. This is on the Euclidean plane in two space. A point here and a point here. How do you? Get, uh, what's the distance between them? It's simply that uh, uh, that function right or that uh, that formula right there. There are lots of different notions of distance. Uh, you, you've got the air distance. You've got Euclidean distance here. You've got what's called the L1 norm distance, or colloquial, colloquially, just the Manhattan distance. If you're on Ma if you're in Manhattan, which is laid out in a perfect grid system, right? Block systems. You can't just go through buildings, right? If you want to get from this street over to this street, you can't just go through all the buildings in a straight line like you would with a Euclidean distance here. Instead, you need to take the Manhattan distance, which is what? You go up north a certain number of blocks, and then you go over uh, east, west, where, where, wherever you're going a certain number of blocks. That's the Manhattan distance. And it has a well-defined mathematical, uh, mathematical interpretation called the L1 norm. Uh, and it's simply just this, but instead of taking the squared right there, you take the absolute value, and then you don't have the square root here. So there are lots of different notions of distance. What I want to do by the end of today is I want to build a distance library. Let's go ahead and have this distance, maybe our law of spherical cosines distance, and maybe uh, the Manhattan distance. All these distance functions, let's go ahead and wrap them up into a library. Before we get there, though, we have to actually write this function. What should I call? I, I need those three things. I need its return type, I need its name, and I need its inputs. So let's start with the easiest one first. What should I call this? I, uh, probably Euclidean distance, right? I want to be Euclidean distance. Or if I wanted to make it a verb, get Euclidean distance or compute, or sorry, compute Euclidean distance. All of those are perfectly fine. I'll go ahead and keep it simple, Euclidean distance. I probably don't want to go any simpler, though, and just say distance, because we've already identified three different ways of thinking about distance. This might be the most common, but there are certainly other notions. Call it what it is. This is the Euclidean distance, not just distance. Well, which distance are you talking about? It's the Euclidean distance. Right? I need to specify its inputs. So what are its inputs here? I'm going to have to take x1, y1, and x2, y2, right? x1, uh, y1, x2, and y2. What kind of variables are those going to be, though? Numbers, obviously, right? What kind of numbers? Doubles, OK. If I had gone with an int instead, like this, say, then that would limit me to the grid points. You could only t compute a distance from 0, 0 to uh, 3, 4, right? There's no such, uh, you wouldn't be able to go from the origin 0, 0 to 3.5, 8.2, right? But by making them all doubles, I am designing this function to be uh, general purpose, right? And I have to define the type of all four of those variables. So x1, y1, x2, y2, those are all doubles. The name of the function is Euclidean distance. The last thing I have to do is define a return type. What kind of variable should this return? Also a double, I'll agree. Right? Again, the distance is not always going to be a whole number. It could be 8.2 uh, meters between two, uh, two points. Right? That's where I specify the return type, double right there. So some syntax notes here, syntax notes. First of all, uh, prototypes end with a semicolon. Right? Why? Because they're a declaration int a is equal to 10, or just int a. That always ends with a semicolon because you are declaring a variable. Here I am declaring a function, so it ends with a semicolon. 
Uh, also, uh, you do not yet provide a uh, uh, a function the the functions definition, right? And I'm going to change this now. Syntax slash style notes, all right? Uh, finally, in general, you always place the documentation with the prototype, right? DRY. Often people will try to take this document, the documentation being that, that comment above. This function computes the Euclidean distance between two variables, uh, two, not two variables, sorry, two points, right? In the Euclidean plane given by whatever, whatever, whatever. You don't want that in multiple places. You don't want that in both the definition later on, which we'll, take, uh, uh, which we'll cover here in a second, and the prototype. Always attach it to the prototype and only attach it to the pro prototype. DRY is the, DR, uh, is the DRY principle. Right? Anybody know what a DRY stands for? Don't repeat yourself. Right? If, you, if you have documentation in multiple different places throughout your code base, and you make a change to the documentation in one, guess what? Then now the, other, the others are out of sync. So if you keep the documentation in one place, changes are localized to that one place. DRY, don't repeat yourself. And in fact, you can apply the DRY principle here to writing functions. This is why you don't cut and paste pieces of functionality. You write it once, put it into a function, and then reuse it. Right? Don't repeat yourself. OK. All right, later on in the program, later on in the program, say after the main, you provide a function definition. All right. It will repeat, uh, it repeats the, uh, the signature, but includes the function body. Right. And does not include the documentation, because again, DRY, don't repeat yourself. So let me go ahead and uh, uh, cut and paste at least the, um, uh, the signature here. So go down. There we go. All right. So instead of that, uh, that semicolon, we're no longer declaring the function. We're actually defining the function. What does it do? When somebody calls or invokes this function, like when you type uh, square root and then put the uh, print, uh, parentheses there, it's actually calling this function. It's executing code that's inside the square root function. When somebody calls Euclidean distance and provides it four input parameters, then it'll uh, start executing the code that is attached to this function body. Instead of uh, the uh, semicolon, you have an opening curly bracket and a closing curly bracket, and this is where you put the code for this function. So with inside this, we're given x1, y1, x2, and y2. Given these four things, we now need to compute this value right here. Right? Help me along here. This is the body of the function. Right? Help me along. Uh, double result is equal to? Well, how do, I, how do I transcribe that there from mathematics into code? All right, so I need to use that square root function. Right. And inside that, I'll do what? x1 minus x2 squared. How do I do that? OK, I could use pow of x1 minus x2 raised to the power 2 plus another pow of y1 minus y2 uh, raised to the second power. Right. That's good. That only computes this result. Right? I need to output this result. I need to give this back to the calling function. When somebody calls this function, they're expecting output back. Give me the Euclidean distance. Right? And uh, just like square root, uh, double uh, y is equal to the square root of 2. Right? You're, you're taking that value in square root, and it, it's returning a value, and you're placing that into the variable y. Inside the function, though, what does it look like? How do we give back a result? So think about, uh, think about the code that you've seen so far. Main. Main returns an integer. What keyword do we have at the end of every main? Return. We're returning a result to the calling function. So we need to go return. Now instead of 0 or 1 or whatever else you're doing, we need to return the value that you actually want to return, the, the output. In this case, result. Right? 
That works. That will work. But there's already some improvements that we can make. Uh, what are some of those improvements? First of all, stylistic pr improvements. I have inconsistent white space here, right? I've got a space before the first power, but not after, after the second. So let's fix that. Uh, space is always good around minus, right? So let's go ahead and put, move, move that out. Uh, what's another stylistic sim uh, simplification that we can make here? I'm computing a res uh, result and then immediately returning it. Yeah. Ah. So let's not make a variable. Let's just compute the value and immediately return it. Return this instead. And now I've cut it down to simply just one line. Right? Simpler code is usually, generally, better code. So I like this a little bit better. Now we don't have a, what's called a local variable. But keep that in mind. I, start, I did that first iteration to show that you can declare local variables. You can declare variables inside of functions, and the, the, the scope of those variables is only inside the function. They don't exist outside the function at all. And we'll return to that, no, that, that concept uh, later on. Right? Is there another improvement that you can see? I'm using a sledgehammer in the math library to solve a simple problem, right? You can use pow, right? And that'll take that difference and then square it. Is there another way I can get a simple square, though? Just multiply, right? x1 minus x2 times x1 minus x2. x1 minus x2. And be consistent with your spacing. Which one is better? It's at this point that you now can get into a style debate. One is not better than the other. It's your personal preference, maybe a style guide that you have to, uh, to adhere to. Uh, I would, uh, now, technically, the first one is more efficient because calling the POW function in the math library is going to do some interpolation method. But don't worry about it because something simple like raising it to a power of 2, uh, the compiler is going to see that, and the compiler is going to optimize it away. The compiler will take your code and say, wait, you don't need to call that function. That's just square, right? Uh, and so it'll, it'll, it'll ch take that second one, that pow, and probably produce code that mo looks more like this when it actually gets compiled to machine code. That's the beauty of compiler optimizations. You don't have to worry about those small level details. Write whatever you think is more readable. If you think the fir first uh, version is more, more readable than the second, do that. If you think the right one is more uh, readable than the, uh, than the first, then you do that. Your goal is to write readable, maintainable code. Let the compiler wor worry about uh, optimizations like that. Okay? I'll leave both of those up there. Uh, of course, you wouldn't probably want to. You'd want to be consistent. I'll leave both of those up there, though, so that you can see them in the notes when they get posted. So again, some syntax notes on this. Uh, the oops, the uh, return keyword is used to end the function and output or return the result to the calling function. Right? Or function, excuse me. Uh, and a, a little note here about uh, variable scoping. Well, again, we'll, we'll examine this in much de more detail later on. Uh, but the variables uh, x1, y1, x2, y2 are all parameter uh, variables. They were never really declared. All right? They existed because they were parameters. Right? We didn't have to do anything special with them. They were part of the function. They were part of the, uh, they, they were part of the function's signature. So we didn't have to declare these variables to use them on these lines of code down here, right? or on this line of code down here. Furthermore, you can create what are called local variables. You can, I should, I should instead of saying, let's be uh, exact about this, you can declare local variables inside functions as well. Right? They only exist within the function and not outside it. Right? So in the first version where I declared a double result, that was a local variable. It only existed in that function. If I called this from, say, the main function, then uh, the, the variable result would not exist in the main function. 
And if I tried to use it in the main function, it would be a, a syntax error. We'll look, exactly, uh, look at exactly why this is probably on uh, Wednesday when we talk about how functions actually work. There's this entire thing called the, the, uh, the, uh, the call stack. Uh, and so it's a data structure called a stack. Well, it's, it's just a stack like a stack of dishes. And it's very efficient to put stuff on top and take stuff off. And, that's how, and it's also used as breadcrumbs. Uh, when a function calls a another function, another dish is placed on the stack. Uh, and that dish contains all of the local variables and parameter variables. Each dish is separate. And so this is why uh, the, the, the variable result existed in one dish, but not another dish. Right? Just understand that you can create local variables for now, though. Right? There's a question? No? OK. Yeah, go uh, way back there. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, that's uh, an inline function. And in C, it gets really hairy because the, the, the scoping of it, uh, like if you inside of main, if you create a function inside of it, it only exists inside of it, and you can only use it inside of it. Uh, and, if you're, if, and if you've done that, then why, why did you create that function to begin with, right? A function, you, you're creating functions because they have functionality that's useful elsewhere. And, and, and then at the same time, by declaring it only inside of a, a main, well, you've limited its use to that main. There are use cases where you'd want to do that. But we'll, never, we'll, we'll not get to any decent use case in this course. Right. All right. So let's talk about modularity. All right. So in general, you can, uh, you, uh, you can uh, let me em emphasize can, place uh, uh, prototypes before the main or before you use them. Uh, and the definitions after the main function, but it's better to separate code out into either modules or whatever you want to call them, libraries, uh, or basically for us, for C, into separate header and source files. And you'll see why. Uh, see this. Uh, this is apparent. Uh, 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 let's see. Yeah, here we go. Th this is where I wanted to be. All right. You'll. You'll. Th this will all look familiar. It's, you've been using these up to this point. When you want to bring in the math library functions, what do you do? You include math dot. What is it? H. What do you think that H stands for? It's a header file. Inside that header file are all the prototypes for all the functions in the math library. In yet another file somewhere else are all the definitions for all those functions. We're separating stuff out so that we're not dealing with one big file. Right? We, sometimes we call that the god, uh, the god file. Uh, if you just take everything and put it into one file, it's acting as everything. It sees everything. It knows everything. It's the god file. You don't want to do that. You want to separate things out into different modules, just like the standard library did. You've got the standard library, you, uh, stdlib. You've got the standard input-output library, stdio.h. You've got the uh, standard math library, math.h. Later on, we'll look at other libraries, the string library, string.h. It's separating all of these different pieces of functionality out and collecting them into modules. Right? We're going to do the same. All right? So what you do is you place uh, uh, prototypes and uh, documentation into a header file. Right? It ends with a .h. Right? And you place uh, all function uh, definitions or implementations into a source file. That is, it ends with a .c of the same name. Generally, you call them, they don't have to be the same name, but you want to, the whole point of doing this is to organize things. So you'll want them to have the same name. Right? Uh, so I'm going to give you a demonstration here. Let's go ahead and create a distance library. Right? I'll put library in quotes here, because of course, our library is only going to be one or two or maybe three functions if we want to do them all. Right? So I'm going to go to the command line here. Uh, and I'm going to create a uh, distance library. 
So we'll call it distance, right? Distance, or we could call it distance utils. Utils short for utilities. I'll go ahead and keep it simple and just call it distance.h. Right? This is my header file. What goes in here is the documentation and the prototypes. So let me go ahead and go back here and cut and paste uh, my, uh, my prototype. There we go. There's my first function. Let's make this a little bit more substantial library. I don't, rem I don't recall the uh, uh, law of spherical cosines off the top of my head, so I'll let you go ahead and cut and paste that if you really want to. But I do remember the, uh, the Manhattan distance, right? So this, this function computes the L1 or the Manhattan, hopefully that, uh, that, that's the correct spelling, distance uh, between two points given by x1, y1, and x2, y2. There we go. So there's my documentation. What would the signature on this one look like for the prototype? What should we call it, first of all? Manhattan distance? And another style note here. How, how am I naming my functions? If there are multiple words, what am I doing here? This is camel casing, lower camel casing. Uh, you, you, you can adopt this style, which I would suggest, uh, or you can adopt a GNU style, which are going to be lower underscore casing, all lowercase letters, separating each word with, a, with an underscore. Again, if you're going to do that, you're always going to be reaching across the keyboard and killing your pinky finger to mash down that, uh, that shift button. All right? So there's Manhattan distance. What's, what's its input going to be? Same exact thing, right? And its output type is going to be what? Double, right? What am I forgetting at the end? Semicolon. Semicolons and prototypes, just like semicolons and variable declarations, right? There's my, there's my header file, right? Uh, Distance.h, it's just a header file. In fact, if I ask the system, what, what kind of file is that? Uh, it's an a C program text, uh, ASCII text, right? Now what I want to do is I want to actually implement these functions in a file, a source file, of the same name. So distance.c. Right? And for this one, again, I'm just going to cut and paste what we had before. Uh, where was it? Uh, there, uh, there we go. Cut and paste from the notes here for the first one. Right? I'll go ahead and get rid of that comment, too. Uh, should I provide a comment here? Documentation? Don't repeat yourself. Make sure that it's only in one spot, and that spot should be the prototypes. It's already over in the header file for us. The second one, though, was Manhattan distance. And it took the same exact stuff here. All right. Help me implement this function now. No need to declare a local variable. Uh, to, to remind you, it's if you need to go up and over in a square, it's just simply going to be this is, the uh, this is the difference between x1 and y uh, uh, x2. Just take the absolute value. It doesn't matter if you go from here to here or from here to here. It's the same distance. And then this one will be the difference in the y values because you're going up or down. Just take the absolute value. It doesn't matter if you're going up or if you're going down. It's the same distance. Right? And that's the absolute value between those two things. So instead of square root, I would return abs x1 minus x2. Maybe be consistent with my spacing there. Plus abs oops, of x y1 minus y2. Right. This is a common mistake. What's going to happen? Abs. What does abs do? It's the absolute value, right? Let's RTM. Read the documentation. Man abs. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. What type of variables does it take? Int. Right? This is why you might be getting zero on some of your stuff, because you're not using the correct absolute value function. What should you be using? For floating point numbers, there's fabs. That takes a double. In fact, there's fabs L and fabs F. And in fact, there's also labs, which is for longs, and lulabs, 
which is for long longs. And there are a couple of other, there are at least maybe a half a dozen to a dozen different functions that all do the same thing, absolute value, but for different variables. We'll get to why that is here in a moment. But let's go ahead and finish up our uh, demonstration first of all. Uh, Emacs, uh, what was it, distance.c? All right, so this is wrong. What should I be using instead? Fabs. Right. Fabs. There we go. OK, great. So let's go ahead and try to compile this. Again, I've got my header file, distance.h. I've got my source file, distance.c. And one has the prototypes and, de and, uh, and a documentation. The other has the definitions. Let's go ahead and try to GCC this up. Whoa, lots of issues here, right? In fact, let me go ahead and clear it out. And let's do that again so that we've got a clean terminal here. So some warnings. Uh, and uh, uh, one warning is, wait a second, fabs, that looks like it's the math library. Maybe you should be including that, right? Another issue is what? Undefined symbols for main. Reference from entry start main executable program. Did I ever write a main? No. A main is required for any executable program, right? We don't have an executable program here, do we? We have a library. You don't execute the math library, right? You use the math library in your executables. Likewise, we're not, exe we're not executing our distance library. We're going to be using it somehow. So we're not, going to, uh, we're not going to compile this and get it a dot out. Instead, we're going to compile this differently using the hyphen C flag, distance.c. Now, before I do this, does anybody remember from the first week what this did? Hyphen C, what do you think that stands for? C, well, not the language. Compile, right? We're going to compile this, but not link it in. Remember that process that I showed you in the first week? If not, there, it's on the videos. You can go ahead and t take a look at it again. Uh, to actually compile something into something that can actually be run on an actual physical computer, you have to take it from this high-level programming language, C, and you have to translate it down into assembly. Then you have to translate it down into machine code. Even then, you still have to link in all of the other libraries that you've, you've included, which are already pre-compiled in the system. As we did this, it, uh, those are just warnings. We'll come back to them. But it did produce something. What did it produce? Dot O, distance dot O. You remember what the dot O stood for? It's an object file. And way back then, uh, four weeks ago, I said, don't worry about the details now. We're going to come back to it. And here we're coming back to it. You can compile a, a, a source file that doesn't have a main, and it'll, it's still usable on the system. It, it, we're not, uh, not going to be able to make heads or tails of it. right? If we, uh, if we try to more, uh, do you really want to do that? It's a binary file. Are you sure? Sure. It's a bunch of garbage, right? For, uh, for, uh, for, uh, at least from our perspective, right? So that's an object file. We were able to compile that object file, right? Now let's go ahead and take care of all those warnings. Uh, let's see, uh, GCC it again, right? Warning, implicitly declaring library function square root implicitly declaring uh, square root again, then pow, then fabs. So what, what did I do wrong here? I didn't include the math library. Where should I include it? Should I include it in distance.h? Do you see any math library functions here? I don't. So we probably don't want to include it in our header file. Do you see any, library, uh, any math library functions here? Yep. So this is where we include math, oops, math, <laughs> math.h, there we go. And now let's go ahead and try compiling again, oops, there we go. And it's very happy now, right? Remember, always compile with the wall flag so that you get all the warnings, and OK, it's still happy, right? There's still a problem with this, though. And it, it, it's not going to become apparent until much uh, later on when we try to use this stuff. But I'm going to take care of the problem right now. So if you have to declare a variable before you can use it, you also have to declare a function before you use it. Do you see a function declaration here? Remember, a function declaration is a prototype. 
Do you see the function prototypes here? Nope. Yet we need them to be able to be aware of them. So what do I need to, I, I, if, I, if I, you need those prototypes, just like you needed square root, pow, and fabs here, you need the prototypes to these two functions that we just wrote. So what should I be doing here? I should be including my library. Right. And I'll do it uh, in, in a separate line here. Include. I'm going to do it a little bit differently, though. Distance.h. Right. You include your own header files in your source files so that you can bring in those prototypes and the compiler is aware of that. It's aware of the fact that there are these two functions. One of them is called Euclidean distance. One of them is called Manhattan distance. They both take four doubles as input. They both produce one double as an output. Right? The compiler would not know that if you did not include the header files. Right? It would just simply think, OK, well, there's this function here. Maybe it's right, maybe it's not. It all goes back way to the 40, oh, 40 years ago, however, however old C is. Uh, in the first versions of C, there were no prototypes, and it was chaos. Uh, if you misspelled something, then it became uh, a guessing game of where uh, it, it, it even became a runtime uh, issue sometimes, uh, where if you, if you didn't have the prototype, it would say, OK, well, uh, there's this function here, and then there's, you try to call it over here. Is this the same function? I have no idea. Uh, by putting pr prototypes in there and by bringing in the uh, prototype here in the uh, source file, you're allowing the compiler to do some extra work for you to verify that everything is correct. That the two functions that you were just wrote, Euclidean distance and Euclidean distance, they match in the number and type of outputs. They match in the outputs uh, uh, types, and they match in the, uh, the function name. If we misspelled it, right, now, oops. Uh, uh, I, I did misspell it, right? Euclidean distance. All right, uh, the distance. Let me go ahead and misspell it in the header file, maybe, instead. There we go. That's probably where it's important. Otherwise, if, if it still doesn't show up, then it, it would definitely show up when we try to compile it in the main. OK, it's not showing up. Uh, it'll, it, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate that later. Uh, oh, I want to make sure that you, OK. I, I erased a U. There we go. Or you know what? I'm going to leave it there so that we can show up. It'll show up later. All right. All right. So I've produced this distance.o file. Let's actually make it's, it's just a library. Let's actually use it. Let's create a driver program. Distance driver. Dot C. This is a driver program. A, a driver is just a program that allows you to, to, to test a function or to run a small program that brings in your libraries and tests them out to see if they're working properly. So let's go ahead and include. Uh, the, now I am going to be outputting stuff, the standard input output library. Uh, I'm going to be including the standard library. I don't know if I want to include the math library yet. Let me hold off on that. But if I want to use my distance library, what do I need to do? I need to include it, right? How did I did it, do it before? Distance.h with double quotes. The technical difference here between these two is that it, it, it just allows the compiler to uh, not have to look in two places. If you put the, we call those langle wrangle, the, the, left, uh, the less than sign, uh, the left angle and the right angled bracket, sometimes those are called langle wrangle. Uh, it, it, if you put that, it, it directs the, uh, it, it tells the compiler to expect these to be standard libraries. And so it's going to go to the system library, somewhere, somewhere stored on the operating system are these object files, and it goes off and looks in that area for them. If it doesn't find them, then it starts looking in the current working directory. And if it doesn't find it there, then it's a compiler error. Uh, but otherwise, if it does find it there, then it goes ahead and, and, and uses it. If you use the double quotes, that short circuits that process and tells the compiler, this is not a standard library. Don't bother looking for it in the standard library folder. Simply skip that first step and go to the current working directory. That's where you'll find it. And, uh, and it's also a stylistic thing. that it, it tells anybody who's looking at this code that this is a user-defined library. It's not a standard library. Right? Uh, it's a user-defined library that, uh, that I need to bring in somehow. Okay. All right, but I've now included it. So int main. Now I can create my main, int argc, char argv. 
And now this is making a little bit more sense, right? Main is the name of the function. What's its return type? Int. What's its arguments? It takes an integer and this uh, char star star. We still don't understand that yet, but don't worry, we will. Right. Not today, not tomorrow, but soon. All right. Let's go ahead and use this. So let me go ahead and just uh, uh, double uh, distant distant uh, dist is equal to. Let's get the Euclidean distance of two points. Give me two points. In fact, let me go ahead and declare some variables here. Double x1 and double x2, or y1. Let me go ahead and make, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you one point. Let's make it the origin. Give me another nice, easily testable point. Double y2 is equal to what? A 1, 1? OK. Now, to understand whether or not it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, so what's that going to be? 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, what should the distance be? Square root of 2, right? Does anybody remember off the top of their head what square root of 2 is? 1.4. OK, so some of you do 1.41. I do too. But uh, I'd have to pull out my calculator for general points like that. Give me a point where off the top of your head, you can do it really easy. 3, 4. Why? What's, what's so special about that point? What is it called? OK, why? 3, 4, 5. What's special about that? Those are Pythagorean triples. An excellent point. Let's go ahead and go with 3, 4. And now we can test to see, uh, output it to test to see if it's 5. Right? So I'll go ahead and give it x1, y1, x2, y2. When you're designing test cases, think about the easy to test test cases first. A Pythagorean triple, just off the top of your head, you knew what it was. If you remembered uh, it was 0, 0 to 1, 1, OK, well, that's the square root of 2. And I remember it's 1.41 something, right? Uh, those are easy to test test cases. Right? Uh, printf distance is percent %f and the line, OK? Now let's go ahead and try to compile this, distance driver.c. Oh. oh, there's a warning here. Well, first of all, let's take care of that warning there first. Uh, what did I not do on my printf? That was not an intentional mistake. That was just an oversight. I did not put in dist. Okay. And again, that would show up if you use that w all flag, which I've set my system up to do here. All right. Let's try that again. Warning, implicit declaration of function Euclidean distance. What was the problem again? I misspelled it. And now the compiler is telling me about that. Uh, that there's, no, there's no function called Euclidean distance with a u, right? Go back into our, uh, what was it called again, distance.h. Spell it correctly, and that warning will not come up. Right. Great. An error still comes up, though. Euclidean distance, what is that? Right. It, the compiler doesn't know what that is. The compiler is aware of something, right? Let's open this up again. The compiler is aware of this header file. What does the header file contain again? Documentation and prototypes. Just with the prototype, can it actually compile something? No, it's just a signature. It takes these inputs, it produces this output, and it's a, here's its name. It doesn't say what it does. That's in the source file. So I need an extra step here. GCC. Well, first of all, let me go ahead and make sure that I'm compiling the, because I, I changed it. There. Now that's fine. GCC. Distance.o is where all that stuff is. And distance driver. Now I'm giving it everything it needs. It already has the prototypes from the header file. I'm giving it the, uh, the actual implementation, the compiled object file here, and the, the source uh, to produce a main a function, uh, the, the main, and, uh, and thus it can produce an output, a dot out. Right. So let's see. If our code was correct, we should expect that the distance is 5. Right. Yeah, it works. Right. Uh, do I have proof that it works, by the way? Does one test case prove that it's absolutely correct? Nope. In fact, does, do five test cases prove that? Do a million test cases prove that? Nope. 
no amount of test cases, unless you test every single possibility, which you could do, yeah, there are billions of them though. Uh, in fact, uh, it would take you to the end of the heat death of the known universe to test them all. But you could test them all as far as doubles go, right? Doubles have, are only a 64-bit uh, number, and so there are a there, they do have a finite representation. So there are a finite number of them, but there are 10 to the 500 possibilities or something like that. And to test them all is impossible. Test cases only provide a level of assurance that your code is correct, a probability that it's correct. It never provides a full 100% proof. There are programming languages that, trust, that strive for that. Uh, there are programming languages where you can program and then uh, 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 along with them write a proof of correctness, right? And uh, there are people that would advocate something like that and that uh, would say that all programmers need to be mathematicians, but the rest of us live in the real world, right? Uh, not all programmers, not all software developers are going to be mathematicians. Uh, and even if you prove your algorithm is correct, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt with a mat mathematical proof, that doesn't stop somebody from coming along and kicking out the, uh, the, the power cord. Right? Uh, there's still there's contingencies that you have to test for that no mathematical proof can, uh, can account for. Right? So you, the, the point there is that you want to test as many test cases as possible to provide an even higher and higher and higher level of assurance that your software is correct. We'll get into uh, more, uh, more on that in unit testing later on. All right, so uh, it, it, it all works. Uh, let's go back over here and uh, describe what we did. Right. There we go. So the demonstration was we placed uh, our uh, prototypes and uh, documentation into a header file named, and this will be posted along with the notes when we get, uh, eventually get to it, distance.h. Uh, we placed the function definitions into a source file named distance.c. Right? You can compile, but not link, the, uh, the uh, distance library using gcc c distance.c, which produces an object file distance. Dot o. That contains the, uh, the implementation detail, or the implementation, right? Then later on, uh, oh, one other thing, uh, in the, distan uh, the distance.c file, we included our header file using include, um, what was distance.h. I, you use double quotes, and you never, and you include the header file, never the source file. Right? That is a common uh, beginner error. You never include the .h file. Here's why. An include is nothing more than a preprocessor directive. What was the other preprocessor directive that we covered very early on? The hash, and instead of include, we used define so that we could define pi or we could define you know uh, what, uh, whatever your uh, e or define a constant remember how it worked though the preprocessor before before the, is something that comes in before it uh, actually compiles your program and simply does a cut and paste whenever you had kilometers per mile it replaced that with the second value whatever that was 1.6 something or whatever all right uh, likewise, the include preprocessor directive is nothing fancy. All it does is comes in to, and takes the contents of that file and does a cut and paste. It takes all the headers, uh, the, the prototypes, and it takes them over and it pastes them in there for you. What if you included the .c file? It'll take a cut and paste of those definitions and put it into that function or into that, uh, that source file. And if you've got the include it twice in multiple places, now it's cutting and pasting the same thing multiple times. When you go to try and compile, say that you cut and paste it, you did it three times. 
When the compiler goes and tries to compile that, it'll see one, two, three copies of that function, and it doesn't know what to do. Because you've got three functions, all the same name, all the same signature, it, it's going to choke. right? You can't have two functions uh, with the same name, which gives you a hint on why we have so many absolute value functions. And we'll cover that again later on. All right. All right, so you never include the source file uh, in, in our driver program, the program that, sorry, save, there we go, that uses our library. We uh, also used the include uh, distance.h, but we compiled using uh, GCC and then uh, distance dot o and distance dot uh, driver dot c right? so that's how you and we ended up compiling everything together to, to actually produce an executable now this was very simple only two functions were in our library what if we had oh 10 functions per module and uh 10 different libraries 10 different modules that we wanted to bring in this process right here gets tedious very very quickly don't worry, there's a solution for that. You used it in your, in your first homework, and, you'll, and we provided it uh, in several different labs after this as well. What did you do to, to compile the Capricar project? Make. And if you take a look at the contents of that make file, there are, all, there are rules to do all of this. Right? If there are 50 different libraries, it, there, there are rules to compile it all so you didn't have to type this process out 50 different times. Instead, you type it out once in a make file or a script that basically defines how to build your project. Uh, we won't necessarily have anything that complicated. And anything that we do have that is that complicated, we give you the make file for it. So you don't have to be writing your own make files. But if you want to, there are plenty of resources out there to do it. Uh, there are lots of build systems like this. Any language, any framework is going to have some sort of a build system. Make is the old school tried and true. Uh, or its, uh, its predecessor is called CMake, which stands for well, C Make, right? Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and other languages, like uh, say Java, uses uh, Ant and Maven or Jenkins. Um, uh, in, in the JavaScript world, there are at least 50 of these tools. Uh, Grunt is one of them that I know of, and a couple of others uh, that allow you to script your build of the project. It, uh, with just one push of a button, it, it compiles everything, it brings everything together, and then produces this thing that which you can now deploy or you can now run. Right? Build systems are an extremely important aspect of software development, of software engineering. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to cover them in detail here. Uh, but if you want to, there are plenty of, there's plenty of resources out there for uh, learning how to create a make file or, in another language, uh, whatever they use. Uh, make is actually general enough that you can uh, use make on any, any programming language that you want. Uh, I remember back when I used to contribute to the, uh, the WDN, which is the Web Developer Network here on campus, they, uh, the, the, the templates, they, you go to a UNL site, website, they, uh, they're, they're style templates. Uh, they, you can contribute to that, by the way, if you want to join them and learn some uh, web technologies or something. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the very earliest versions, they actually used Make uh, to build that website. It just took all of these CSS files and JavaScript files and brought them all together and, and produced uh, UNL's main website. Uh, they don't, uh, or at least the templates. Uh, they moved on to uh, some other build system now. They probably had like two or three different build systems that they've changed because that's how the JavaScript world works. Uh, if something is more than a week, a week old, you get rid of it and do something new, right? All right, that, yes, that is a knock on JavaScript. Right? It's my, uh, 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 so uh, often people ask me, what, what, what's your favorite programming language? And again, I, I like to quote, or uh, steal a quote from Churchill. Uh, Winston Churchill was asked, you know, uh, about democracy. He said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others, right? So just take democracy and replace that with any programming language. C is the worst programming language, except for all the others. Likewise, JavaScript is the worst programming language, except for all the others. Uh, PHP is truly the worst programming language, but uh, <laughs> so I won't, I won't say that about PHP. Uh, but any, any other language, C-sharp is the worst programming language, except for all the others. 
The point is there's no perfect language. If there were a perfect language, it's all we would use. Uh, languages are nothing more than personal preferences of somebody, I like that in that language, but I don't like that in that language. I'm going to make my own language so that I have all the things that I like. Right? Or, or a company's fighting. Right? The, job, uh, uh, the whole reason that we have um, C Sharp is because Microsoft didn't want to play nice with other companies. So we're going to make our own stuff. Uh, that also gave, uh, gave birth to their version of, uh, of, of um, uh, JavaScript. I forget what it was called, though. Uh, Anyway, it was all unified in ECMA script. So there's really no JavaScript. There's ECMA script. Uh, but you'll, you'll find that all over the place. There's no, good pro there's no good programming language. There's no perfect programming language. There's programming languages that you're going to like. There are programming languages that you're not going to like. Uh, or there's another quote by one of the people, uh, Bjorn Strauss, up the uh, author of C++, that said that there are languages uh, that, uh, that uh, what was it? Dang it. There are languages that uh, people hate, and then there are, lang uh, there are or, no, there are, there are languages that people love, and then there are languages that people actually use. Right? So uh, there's, a, there, there's a disconnect there. there uh, people have academic languages that they fall in love with, but that aren't really used in the real world. Um, uh, so you'll, you'll need to learn at least two, three, four, five, a dozen programming languages. Uh, by the time you're out, uh, uh, out, out in the world. Uh, if you're CSCE uh, CE and you want to go into, into that industry. Uh, if you're CSCE, you'll definitely be learning no less than four languages in your first year. C in this course. Next semester, it'll be Java and SQL. Uh, and uh, maybe not four anymore, but certainly three by the end of your first year. Right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's in 156. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm slated to teach that as well. So if, uh, you're stuck, if, you're, if you're continuing on to CS2 next semester, you're stuck with me for another semester. Uh, it'll, be in the same, it'll be in the same room, by the way, with the same uh, video equipment, uh, and, but a, little, a slightly different format. All right. All right, any questions so far on any of this stuff? No? OK, then. Uh, oh, by the way, what is the perfect programming language? Perfect. There's not yet. Think Star Trek. How did they program a computer? Natural language. They just told it what to do. That's still 50, 100 years off into the future. <laughs> It'll happen someday. 